Good afternoon, and thanks for joining us at the Political Futures event. Today we'll be talking about the famous, or should I say infamous, Electoral College. We'll be examining what it is, why it's controversial, and what this could mean for its future. I'm sure it's not lost on any of you how important this is, what with the US election sneaking up on us, in what promises to be one of the most contentious contests in recent times. With all this in, my, in mind, I'd like to introduce our guest speaker today, Dr. Daryl West. Dr. West is the Vice President and Senior Fellow of Government Studies at the Brookings Institution in Washington, D.C., and also holds the Douglas Dillon Chair in Government Studies. Previously, he was the John Hazen White Professor of Political Science and Public Policy and Director of the Taubman Center for Public Policy at Brown University. His current research focuses on American politics, technology policy, and artificial intelligence. Dr. West, thank you for joining us. The floor is yours. Thank you, Jack. It's great to be with you. It's a pleasure to uh, speak at uh, Cambridge. Appreciate your interest in the Electoral College, although I know uh, many of you are uh, working uh, remotely, taking classes uh, remotely. Uh, it's been a trying time for uh, everyone all around the world. Mm. So, uh, as Jack mentioned, before uh, coming to Brookings about a decade ago, I taught political science for 26 years at Brown University. And I would have to say, during most of that time, I defended the Electoral College as an important part of our political system. Uh, at that point in time, uh, many of my students were skeptical, uh, if not outright hostile to the Electoral College, didn't understand why it had been uh, created and why we still had it. And what I would tell them was the Electoral College was a compromise between the large and small states in the United States. And it was also a compromise between those who wanted a strong national government versus those who wanted the states to have a greater uh, priority. Uh, and as a compromise, it obviously was imperfect, but what the founders had in mind was a group that would be independent of the leading institutions and capable of exercising its own independent judgment about the presidential candidates. So it was really set up as a peer review mechanism uh, of individuals who knew the candidates, could speak to their character, to uh, what they wanted to do as president, and basically vouch for them and choose uh, the best uh, individual. But since my time at Brown University, I have changed my view on the Electoral College and have come to believe that now is a time to abolish the Electoral College. Uh, and uh, today I'll kind of explain my reasoning on this and then be happy to open the floor to any uh, questions or comments uh, that you have. The big problem that I see is the Electoral College has become an anti-majoritarian institution. Five times uh, in American history, the person who won the popular vote lost the Electoral College, but it has now happened twice in the last five presidential elections, and it actually could happen in 2020. At this point, we're just a few days before America's national election, I'm actually pretty confident Joe Biden is going to win the popular vote, probably by several million votes, but it still is not clear whether he will win the Electoral College. Uh, the vote margins in those uh, six or seven uh, swing states still are very close, uh, and so that creates a degree of uncertainty. And so my worry as a political scientist who studies American politics is if we keep having elections where the individual who loses the popular vote becomes president, that's going to create a constitutional crisis. So if, for example, uh, Trump uh, wins the Electoral College, that will mean three of the last six presidential elections, there's been a split outcome uh, between the popular vote and the Electoral College. That starts to undermine popular support uh, for our political system. Uh, it starts to reduce the public legitimacy needed to govern effectively. It creates a number of problems, both from the standpoint of democracy as well as uh, governance. So last year, I wrote a paper for the Brookings uh, website. It's still there at brookings.edu, so you can uh, reference it uh, if you want uh, more uh, details. But uh, I argue that given 
uh, several different developments, it's becoming increasingly likely that we will have a split outcome between the popular vote and the Electoral College. And so the two times that it has happened in the last two decades actually is a leading indicator of something that likely is going to become more prevalent if we maintain uh, the status quo. The reason why I think uh, there is a greater chance of having uh, split outcomes is one, the growth of geographic disparities in the United States. So my Brookings colleague, Mark Miro, uh, did an interesting analysis a few years ago. And at that time, he found 15% of American counties generated 64% of our GDP. What that means is most of America's economic activity is concentrated on the East Coast, the West Coast, and a few metropolitan areas in between. But much of the country is being left behind. And this is a real problem. I mean, this is actually one of the things that has fueled public discontent uh, with uh, the U.S. government and this feeling that too many people are being uh, left behind. The Electoral College is part of this uh, in the sense that because the Electoral College overrepresents small and medium sized uh, states, that it overrepresents the parts of America that are not experiencing hardly any economic uh, prosperity. And so, what is happening, and we've seen it uh, twice uh, one in the case of, uh, of uh, Trump, and then uh, secondly, when George W. Bush lost to Al Gore in the popular vote, but won the Electoral College and uh, became president, that the small and medium sized states are overrepresented. And so it is overrepresenting the part of America that is not doing well. And it creates governance problems because it makes it difficult to address the big problems that America faces, uh, such as uh, income uh, inequality. And this problem is likely to get worse before it gets better because three quarters of our current venture capital money goes to California, New York, and Massachusetts, meaning it's going to three states uh, and the other 47 states are being left behind. So to the extent that venture capital investment predicts the future economy, inequality is likely to increase in the future. Uh, and so therefore this trend of a lot of the country voting one way, but then the small and medium sized states voting another and therefore uh, electing the next uh, president, this becomes a big problem. The second issue that I think is likely to increase the odds of a split outcome is the rise of political polarization in the United States. So last year I published a book entitled Divided Politics, and it basically was a family memoir about polarization, uh, because we know the United States is divided between blue states and the red states. Uh, there are a lot of political uh, divisions here, and they become more intense uh, over time. But I grew up in a rural Ohio community in the American Midwest that was very conservative. But then I taught at Brown University for a number of years, which is a very liberal uh, campus. So I've lived among both the liberal and the conservative tribes. My immediate family is a microcosm of divided America because I have two sisters who stayed in the rural community where I grew up. They're a Christian fundamentalist and they love Donald Trump. And then I have a brother who is liberal and gay, and he hates Donald Trump. So you can only imagine what our family reunions are alike. But the many sources of political polarization that I talk about in that uh, book, Divided Politics, kind of illustrates why the Electoral College is making it more difficult for the United States to address the root causes of our polarization. Uh, in that book, I talk about the root causes of polarization being things like the increase in income inequality, the geographic disparities uh, that I just mentioned, kind of the new role of uh, the news media and how uh, polarizing and partisan uh, our news outlets have become, uh, the rise of digital technology, so the reliance on the social media. Technology, in a lot of ways, encourages uh, extremism and uh, polarization and makes it easy for those with extreme views to find uh, like-minded individuals. So in a highly polarized situation, if we continue our current approach and don't address the root causes of polarization, America is headed for a disastrous future uh, where we're unable to address our fundamental problems, 
inequality and polarization and extremism get worse uh, and it becomes a, a big problem in the United States. Uh, it's the type of situation where if we don't get rid of the Electoral College, as well as make other types of voting reforms and institutional reforms, Trumpism is going to outlast Trump. Like even if Trump himself loses uh, the 2020 uh, national election, Trumpism is going to endure for a number of years because Trump is just reflecting these underlying forces that already exist in society. Like he did not create uh, these factors. He has exploited them and uh, made them worse. Uh, but even after he leaves the scene, those underlying conditions still are going to be there. And so it's for those uh, reasons uh, that I think it's time to uh, get rid of the Electoral College. And American democracy is really at a crucial uh, turning point uh, right now. And it can go in several different uh, directions, uh, more positive directions and less uh, positive uh, directions. And I think, you know, what happens in our election uh, next uh, week will tell a lot about what the future of the United States is uh, likely to be. Uh, so those are just a, a few opening remarks to uh, get the uh, conversation uh, started, but I'd be happy to hear any comments uh, you have. I'd love to hear your uh, points of view on uh, these uh, issues and happy to address any questions that people may have. Um, thank you ever so much for your speech, Dr. West. It was uh, quite a joy to hear. Um, we'll just have a, one, one question just to start off, if, if, uh, if we may. Um, you mentioned polarization in your speech. Uh, do you think there's a risk at all, uh, what with you know the Electoral College advantaging the Republicans um, to some degree, that if you were to abolish it, that the forces of disinformation and uh, ability to mobilize public opinion against uh, one side of society would actually, it would actually result in more polarization um, once it was abolished because the Republicans would say, oh, it's an attack on our institutions and, and whatnot. I don't think moving to direct popular election is going to make disinformation and misinformation uh, worse. If anything, it might actually help on those fronts because the problem we have now with the Electoral College is about 40 of the 50 American states are pretty predictable in how they vote. You know, there are states that are reliably Republican, there are states that are reliably uh, Democrat. I mean, depending on the election, there often are only eight to 10 American states that are swing states uh, that are uh, competitive. The problem with the Electoral College and the fact that a very small number of states are in play, and it often is small and medium-sized states that are in play. So like this year, you know, North Carolina is in play, uh, Iowa is in uh, play, uh, Georgia is in play, Arizona is in uh, play, that when you have a small number of of uh, medium-sized uh, states that are basically the power brokers. If you're a Russia that is interested in disrupting American elections, it's actually pretty easy to do so from a geography standpoint, mm -hmm. because basically you know that if you can disrupt a few communities in a state like Pennsylvania, you may be able to throw the election. If you disrupt, say, the voting in the Miami, Florida area, you could disrupt uh, mm. Florida uh, result, and therefore uh, end up uh, uh, tilting uh, the whole election. If we got rid of the Electoral College, the large states would be more powerful because they have uh, bigger uh, populations, but it's harder to target on a geographic basis the disinformation uh, campaigns. And so, you know, if we had one person, one vote, like a person's vote in Montana is equivalent to a, versus, to a person's uh, vote in California, it becomes a lot harder for either foreign actors or U.S. domestic actors to engage in mischief. Uh, so mm -hmm. I actually think the disinformation problem would uh, become less acute if we got rid of the Electoral College. Excellent. That, that's, that's very interesting. Um, how do you think that the institutions that sort of uh, or gravitate around the current institutions that we have, uh, the sort of um, non-governmental organizations, uh, do you say, um, how do you think they would interact with a change to uh, proportional representation? Because I, I feel like they're you know, very much integrated with the current system as it is now. Do you think the institutional battleground would shift? I think it could affect uh, the institutional battleground and it certainly would affect the political dynamics uh, of America. But I think 
it would do so in a more positive uh, direction. So you're right that right now under the Electoral College and uh, the current uh, rules of elections, it basically reinforces the power of the two major parties at a time when many Americans actually are disenchanted uh, with the parties. Like if we actually did have a proportional representation system, America would end up with multiple parties and you would end up with coalition uh, governments. Uh, and you know there, are, there could be problems with that type of system, but right now in a, in a political system dominated by two parties and Americans not really being big fans of either one of them at this point in time, it makes, it, it makes the polarization worse because basically people now are having to choose between a progressive Democrat and a ultra-nationalist Republican most Americans, if you look at public opinion polls, are still in the middle. Like Americans tend to be centrist in their uh, political views, but we're not being offered centrist choices. We're being offered polarized choices between leftist uh, Democrats and very conservative uh, Republicans. And so it creates a weird dynamic. Uh, and it also furthers public cynicism because you know people feel like they're not getting the choices that they want. So if we got rid of the Electoral College and had direct uh, popular election, we would probably end up in a situation where there are more choices. Uh, America might, over a period of time, move to a multi-party system. Uh, and it therefore could end up in a situation where we were in a better uh, position to address the polarization, to solve problems, and to deal with the serious underlying issues like income inequality uh, that we have. So you're absolutely right that, you know, if you kind of change one of the major institutions that governs elections, are there going to be consequences? Yes, absolutely. It's going to change the dynamics, could change the party configuration, could change uh, the strategies, could change uh, the way uh, people campaign. But some of those changes actually would be positive for our system and I think would put us in a stronger position to solve the problems that we need to solve going forward. Mm -hmm. I, you, you mentioned the idea of you know, um, parties uh, changing and systems changing. How, how specifically do you think, say, the Republican Party would respond to a proportional uh, representation system in ideological terms, perhaps? Well, I think we would end up with at least four parties. Uh, you would basically have the Trump wing of the Republican Party, uh, which is kind of the America first, ultra nationalist, anti-immigration uh, wing. But then you have a bunch of Republicans that historically have not embraced those ideas. Like uh, Republicans traditionally have been the party of free trade, uh, not anti or not as vehemently anti-immigration as uh, uh, Trump is, uh, wanting America to play more of a role in the world. Uh, more willing to deploy military force uh, abroad. So, you know, there are at least two uh, substantial groups within the Republican Party. Uh, and so they would just simply divide and have their own parties. On the Democratic side, you have the same dynamic of you have the progressive side of the party that has moved to the left and gotten more influential over the last four years, in part in reaction to uh, Donald Trump. But then you still have... Uh, the centrist Democrats, the moderate Democrats, kind of the Clinton uh, Democrats who, you know, have not uh, really embraced kind of the left wing agenda. Uh, and so those two elements might divide. So, you know, those could be the four parties, uh, the leftists, the centrist Democrats, the moderate Republicans, and then the Trump Republicans or the ultra nationalists. And that would create a very different political conversation America would no longer be a 50-50 country then. Now, it might be a 25-25-25-25 country. Uh, and then the question is like, how do you build a majority? But, you know, in a situation of coalition governments, like if your party only has, let's say, 30% of the vote, in order to gain majority control, you have to negotiate with another uh, L or another party. And so <laughs> that could have a moderating uh, impact on uh, the way American politics operates. No, I think that, that sounds very apt. Um, I mean, it, with, with regards to the 
the demographics in, in America, you mentioned the idea of the, being positive to have one vote, one person, and about the intentions behind the Electoral College when it was first set up. I mean, is there a risk, what with there being, in, in some respects, so many different Americas, that you could end up with certain interests being underrepresented, uh, underrepresented sorry, such as I don't know, agriculture, per se? Well, there are certainly interests that would be underrepresented, but they are interests that are small interests. Like, I believe in American agriculture today, that's only about 1.5% of the population. Uh, so they would get represented at the level of 1.5% as opposed to whatever it is now, which is a higher uh, percentage uh, than uh, that. But to me, that's not a problem. Like, if parts of American society, parts of, uh, of uh, American culture have grown population-wise, they need to gain representation. And where you see this dynamic really play out is in terms of American minorities. Because as you may know, if you look at current demographic trends in the United States, by about 2045, so it's only 25 mm -hmm. years, if you add up the number of African Americans, Latinos, and Asian Americans, they are going to constitute a majority of Americans. At that point in time, American politics is going to be very different than it is uh, today. Like somebody like Trump could absolutely never get elected in that uh, kind of situation. I mean, I think even 10 years from now, somebody like Trump would, uh, it would be impossible for him to uh, win a uh, national uh, election. So uh, as the uh, percent of the population grows uh, based on racial and ethnic uh, minorities, they need the representation commensurate with their proportion of the population. If the Electoral College slows that down, if the U.S. Senate slows that down, because in the Senate, you know, there are 50 states, each state has two senators, regardless of the population size, that's another way that uh, individuals get underrepresented in ways that could turn out to be very uh, problematic. I mean, Right now, Republicans have incentives to slow down demographic change by engaging in voter suppression. And basically, you know, you simply remove the polling places from minority neighborhoods. You take the polling places out of college campuses so that young people, uh, it's not so easy for them uh, to vote. I mean, that's what they're doing in this election because they can see the long-term dynamic. They know they can't change the demography, but they can uh, certainly uh, slow it down. So I think moving to direct popular voting would actually change that dynamic. It would lead to more equitable representation and it would significantly reduce the incentives that Republicans have right now to engage in voter suppression. Mm. I mean, what well, you, you, you mentioned in your talk, uh, you know, the, the constitutional crisis that this could cause. I mean, correct me if I'm wrong, but to my understanding, the Electoral College is enshrined in was Article 2 of the Constitution. I mean, would you effectively have to undertake a, a huge uh, drive to get states on board to uh, change the, the um, Electoral College or abolish it as, as it stands? And what is the feasibility? Yes, exactly. uh, that is exactly the case. The argument that I'm making is going to require an amendment to the U.S. Constitution. And I have friends who tell me, well, that's too hard. Like, you know, we'll never be able to do that. Because to amend the U.S. Constitution, it requires a two-thirds vote both in the House mm -hmm. and the Senate, and then three-quarters of the states have to ratify that. And right now, in a country that's, you know, divided on a 50-50 basis, that clearly would be impossible. But the argument that I make with people is they should not be limited by the status quo. They should not be limited by what our politics are like today. Today, it would be impossible to pass a constitutional amendment to uh, get rid of the Electoral College. But because of the demographic uh, changes that we just talked about, the fact that young people are more liberal than older people, that 10 years from now, things that are utterly impossible in America are going to become possible. And 20 years from now, things that are inconceivable uh, in America today are going to be quite possible. Because as young people uh, age 
And as there come to be uh, more minorities in the U.S. Uh, population, minorities are more liberal in their political views. Young people are more liberal in their point of views. Many progressive ideas that are contentious right now, or some of them are even impossible right now, they are going to become mainstream 10 and 20 years from now. And an idea like structural change, you know, getting rid of the Electoral College, which I admit is impossible right now, it's not going to be impossible 10 and 20 years from now. And the last point I want to make on this front is if you look at public opinion polling on getting rid of the Electoral College, because Republicans have benefited twice in the sense that they lost the popular vote, but they won the presidency by winning uh, the Electoral College, George W. Bush and uh, Donald and Trump. Right now, Republicans tend to want to keep the Electoral College and Democrats want to uh, get rid of it. But Texas is becoming a competitive state. Uh, we call it a purple state as opposed to red uh, uh, being Republican uh, states and uh, blue being uh, Democratic states. Texas is very competitive uh, this year. I mean, I still think Donald Trump will carry Texas, but Biden in the current public opinion polling is only down three or four percentage points. I mean, that is miraculous. Uh, most Republican candidates carry Texas easily, you know, by 10 points, 15 points, or uh, even more. Uh, Texas has never really been uh, competitive uh, for Democrats for a, a very long uh, time. That is changing now because of immigration into Texas and the fact that there are people who used to live in the North that have now uh, migrated to Texas. And so the politics of Texas are starting to change. As soon as Democrats are able to win Texas, if Democrats win California, New York, and Texas, it will be impossible for a Republican to uh, become president uh, because of the Electoral College. Uh, and so once Texas becomes truly uh, competitive, even Republicans are going to turn against the Electoral College because they're gonna see that's going to harm uh, their uh, party. And I don't know if that's going to be 10 years from now or maybe uh, some uh, later time, but it's going to happen in the not very uh, distant future. And at that point, the politics are going to change very dramatically. And so our ability to get the two thirds votes in the House and Senate and the three quarters of votes in the states, it actually will be easy at that point in time and we will get rid of the Electoral College. So I'm completely confident we will get rid of the Electoral College during your lifetimes. Very, very interesting. I mean, you, you, you mentioned the uh, changeability of young people's opinions over time. Um, and is, there not, is it not necessarily uh, the case that over time, given a less polarized system from the systematic level, that in, in the sort of Churchill-esque quote, um, that the young people will actually become more conservative as they got older and less um, malleable to, you know, wanting the electoral college to change that is certainly possible uh and there are strong arguments that get made that uh young people start out liberal and become more conservative over time uh that they get married uh they buy home that they buy homes they take on debt and when you start to accumulate economic resources uh then you become more conservative you don't want high taxes you don't want a lot of uh, regulation and so on and it is quite possible uh, that could be the case. I think it may not be the case with this particular generation because the things that are making young people in America more liberal than uh, their uh, older uh, counterparts, I think are some of the longer term trends that are not going to go away. So for example, the loss of economic opportunity that mm -hmm. young people in America clearly are experiencing I mean, just going back to the Great Recession of 2008 and 2009, that was a real blow to young people uh, in America in the sense that they lost job opportunities. The cost of going to American colleges increased. And so, you know, they would graduate with $75,000 in debt, $100,000 in debt, or even more. And so that juxtapositioning of not having a lot of economic opportunity finding jobs hard to get and having very large uh, higher education debt, 
Like that was a real problem. Now, 10 years later, because of COVID, it's exactly the same thing, only it's worse uh, than what it was uh, 10 years ago. That the economic disparities between the young and old are growing even more intense. The young people are graduating uh, today uh, with very limited uh, job uh, prospects. They still have heavy uh, debts. Uh, they believe very much in climate change as an existential threat to the world as a whole. Uh, young people are much more interested in racial justice and addressing the racial problems uh, that have uh, been uh, in the United States uh, ever since our uh, founding. So I think there's always a chance that uh, American youth will become more conservative as they age, but given their current liberals is driven by issues like income inequality, the geographic disparities, uh, questions of racial justice, and like none of those problems are gonna go away 10 years from now, or probably even 20 years from now. So, so some of the moderated the views of young people in the past may not do so in the future. Yeah, I mean, I, th I think that's that's a that's very fairly put. I mean, do you think that it would necessarily be the Democrats and Republicans that were split into two parties, or do you think you can see the result the rise of the Libertarian Party, or, or, or for example? There could be a bunch of new parties. I mean, we could have Republicans splitting in half, Democrats splitting in half. There could be a real Green Party to reach out to those uh, environmentalists and those worried about uh, climate change. There could be libertarians who just don't want government involvement in any uh, respect, either economic policy or social and uh, cultural uh, issues. So, you know, if we didn't have our current institutional arrangements, if you look at American public opinion, just from the standpoint of where people are, like there are probably five, six or seven different clusters of people that could form the basis of a party. So, uh, but of course, you know, you have to start to get rid of the two party advantages in order to free up public opinion to kind of organize themselves in that way, as opposed to a Republican versus a Democratic candidate. And, and with the electoral system, I mean, you talk about proportional representation, but is that, do you think that's a necessary step to a transition or do you think it could be in another uh, electoral system such as the first past the post system in the UK that we have here, for example? It could move in any one of several uh, different uh, directions. Uh, and the dynamic that I think ultimately will lead America to getting rid of the electoral college is likely to also produce other types of institutional and structural uh, changes uh, that will weaken the current uh, party system. Now, whether that ends up generating a true multi-party system uh, with proportional representation or a British model of maybe several parties, uh, but you know, let's say two dominant uh, parties. Uh, there are a lot of variations uh, in which it can go. And ultimately the answer to that will depend on, you know, what the institutional uh, changes are because there are some that could lead to three parties, some that could lead to five, some that could lead to 10. Mm. Mm, sure. I mean, in the, how, how do you envision the immediate aftermath be the, uh, being there? Because I mean, Obviously, this would be a change that would take place over time, the prospect of having multiple parties. Do you think that it would be a case that, due to the popular vote generally siding with the Democrats, that it would end up just being Democratic uh, presidencies for a while? Well, if we end up in a situation where the country becomes more liberal because of young people aging and immigration and demographic uh, change, what will probably happen in that situation is the Democratic Party will split in two. You'll have the progressive wing and the centrist. Mm -hmm. Like AOC has already said, you know, people keep asking her about Joe Biden, whom she has endorsed because uh, even though she has major policy differences with Biden, Biden clearly is much more acceptable to her than Trump, who's uh, completely uh, unacceptable. But she made an interesting comment one uh, time. 
uh, in the context of discussing her policy differences with Biden, in which she said, in a lot of countries, Joe Biden and I wouldn't even be in the same party. And that's kind of acknowledging a future possibility that, you know, the progressives are just going to split off and become their own party. Uh, and the centrist Democrats will be left as the uh, Democratic uh, Party. I think whether that happens depends on how quickly these political changes uh, unfold, uh, whether young people stay liberal or you know start to moderate as they age. So, I mean, there are a lot of kind of interesting questions along the way that would dictate that uh, final answer. Uh, and obviously, we can't predict uh, which of those will uh, be most important. Could you address the original argument for the Electoral College? I mean, you know, the prospect of uh, mediating uh, or tempering, should I say, uh, direct democracy with the sort of Burkean style of representative democracy. Well, the original vision of the founders was the Electoral College was going to be composed of quote unquote wise men. And I say men because women did not have the right to vote, so it literally was uh, men. But they also meant it to be wise men, like the knowledgeable people within each state who could exercise peer review of uh, presidential candidates and pick uh, the best person. Like, you know, our first president, George Washington, basically, you know, the elites were more or less united, like he was the guy, like he was the best uh, choice. Uh, and then in the second presidential election, it basically operated the same way, that there's kind of the the wise man of the Electoral College felt like he was uh, the obvious uh, choice. So the problem that we face today is that conception of the Electoral College is completely undemocratic because like, it wasn't even clear that the founders wanted the public to decide because they didn't trust the public then. You know, this is more than 200 years ago where we did not have mass literacy. I think less than 10 percent of uh, the public, you know, read a newspaper at that point in time. The founders were very suspicious of the general public. They felt they were not knowledgeable enough or wise enough to be given uh, the ability to directly choose the president. So. They came up with this mechanism of the Electoral College because they didn't trust the general public uh, and they wanted wise men uh, to be the ultimate deciding force. But then political parties came on the scene, things polarized around 1800, uh, and then uh, the Electoral College kind of quit functioning as a body of wise men exercising independent judgment and basically became a mechanism uh, for the two parties to have uh, uh, alternative candidates with electors pledged to those individuals. So at that point, it quit functioning as an independent body. But the original conception was completely undemocratic in the way that they envisioned presidential elections operating. And what do you think the consequences of having electors voting against what their um, constituencies have voted for? Well, we may find out next week, uh, and if we do find that out, that is going to spark a complete constitutional crisis. Like, there are some elements uh, of the Trump campaign that are encouraging state legislators to send, like if there's a contested election, uh, you could end up with two sets of electors being sent to the U.S. Congress. Like, the Democrats will claim they won Pennsylvania, so they're going to send Democratic electors to cast the votes of Pennsylvania. But there could be Republicans who claim that they actually won because of ballot fraud or you know, whatever reason, and they could send their electors uh, to uh, Congress. That then is going to create a uh, interesting situation where Congress is going to have to decide which party actually won Pennsylvania or some other state, and which set of electors to accept from that particular state? Do they accept the Republican electors or the uh, Democratic electors? And this actually happened. There's uh, the 1876 election in the United States 
is a situation uh, where this actually happened. Uh, you know, it's kind of right after the uh, Civil War. So again, it was a pretty polarized period in American politics. Uh, you know, the divisions between the North and the South still were uh, quite uh, strong. We had the presidential election. There were contested ballots in three particular states. And it wasn't, there was no agreement on who won uh, those, uh, uh, those particular states. The way that Congress resolved that was to form a, a commission composed of House members, senators, and members of the U.S. Supreme Court, and they decided who won uh, those uh, particular uh, states. And it turned out to be a very important election in American history because the Democrats, Sam Tilden, won the popular vote. Uh, the Republican, Rutherford B. Hayes, did not win the popular vote, but this commission gave the votes of those three contested states to Rutherford B. Hayes, he became president, and part of the agreement for him to win the votes of those three states was to agree to withdraw the federal troops from the South. And so there was a period of American liberalization in the 10 years right after the Civil War where, there, where slavery was abolished, voting rights were extended to African Americans, African Americans voted, uh, there were Southern legislatures that had a majority of their representatives who were African-Americans. There were African-Americans who were elected uh, statewide. But as a result of the 1876 election, and particularly the decision to pull federal troops out of the South, the, the white Southerners basically came back into power, you know, organized vigilante justice, uh, lynched African-Americans. They ended up denying uh, voting rights. And it took America a hundred years, literally 1865 through uh, 1965, for America to pass voting rights legislation. And so that election of 1876 had consequences that endured for a century uh, in terms of uh, voting rights. So if America next week ends up in a contested election, and let's say Pennsylvania is the crucial state and both parties send their electors uh, to uh, Congress, uh, it's gonna be an interesting question how Congress actually resolves that. You know, the one historical reference is uh, 1876. Uh, Congress could be guided by that or they could be, uh, they could uh, take action in a different uh, way. But when I talk about there being a constitutional crisis, situations like that would create a constitutional crisis and there could be public unrest. Uh, there certainly would be a lack of legitimacy uh, uh, in terms of that election outcome. That is kind of the nightmare scenario for, uh, for next week. And just one more question, if I may, before I go to questions from the audience. If you had to pinpoint one particular issue in American history that the Electoral College has blocked, the most significant one, what, what do you think that would be from actually getting a place on in public discourse and on, on the stage? Well, I wouldn't blame this entirely on just the Electoral College, but I do think the Electoral College made the resolution of this issue much more uh, difficult, uh, and that's race. I mean, clearly America has done a terrible job dealing with uh, uh, racial injustice, uh, uh, racial relations in general, and there are many reasons uh, why uh, that is the case, but our institutional arrangements have made it more difficult to address that issue, both in the past as well as right now, and if we don't make some changes, it will continue uh, to make it mm -hmm. uh, more uh, difficult. Uh, and, and just to illustrate why that is a particular problem, like if you had direct popular elections, as minorities gain more political power because of their uh, rising uh, population, America will adjust to that issue by taking steps to alleviate the concerns of minority uh, communities. If you maintain the Electoral College, that progress is going to be slower. It's going to be harder to address the root causes, you know, the economic causes, the social uh, causes, and so on. 
our ability to solve that problem becomes more problematic. So it's just, I'm not saying that the Electoral College is the only reason we haven't dealt with uh, this issue, but it's part of the problem of our institutional arrangements that have made it more difficult to address that and other kinds of issues. Thank you very much. And I think we're going to pivot over to some questions that the audience has for you now. Uh, so to all of our viewers, if you haven't done so already, please submit your questions for Dr. West. We have some comments on the live video that we can have a look now. You can, you can submit comments on either Facebook or YouTube or Twitter. So we have a question here. If getting rid of the electoral college is impossible for now, are there any politically realistic ways to make it more representative in the short to medium term? There are two proposals that are floating uh, right now. So keep in mind the electoral college is the sum of the number of house members, uh, which is uh, uh, 435, and the number of senators, uh, which is 100. Uh, if Democrats gain the presidency, keep the House, and get a majority of the Senate, one of the things they've already said they want to do is to grant statehood to Washington, D.C., which is two more senators, and they would be two Democratic senators, and statehood for Puerto Rico if Puerto Rico has a referenda and approves uh, a statehood. That, again, would be two additional senators, uh, likely Democratic uh, senators. So one way to start to get at the representation problems in the Senate as well as in the Electoral College is to start adding states that then change uh, uh, the way the system operates. So, and by the way, uh, providing statehood for D.C. and Puerto Rico are simple majority votes. So if Democrats have a majority in the House and Senate, they can do that. Uh, a Biden uh, president would certainly uh, sign that. That's very easy uh, to do. So that's kind of uh, the easy way that you start to uh, deal with uh, these uh, questions of uh, political representation. A second way to do it, uh, there's something called the National Popular Vote Interstate Compact, which is an agreement among states to basically award its electors to whomever wins the popular vote nationally. So it's a way to basically get rid of the power of the electoral college without going through the process of a constitutional amendment that is difficult and will take a long time, that if you can get a sufficient number of states to agree to basically uh, prevent the possibility of there being a split outcome between the popular vote and the Electoral College, that also would take care of the issue. Now, the advantage of that approach is it doesn't require a constitutional amendment to do that. It just takes you know, a state legislature passing a law to agree to uh, do that. But the downside and the thing that worries some people is because that is not a constitutional change, it's not clear what the legal viability is. So. Let's say there are 30 states that agree to that. They have a majority of electoral college votes, so that would eliminate the possibility of a split outcome. What happens if they agree to do that? Uh, you know, a Republican wins uh, the popular vote, but people in some of those 30 states don't want a Republican to be president. What happens if a few of those states basically refuse to uh, go along with that interstate uh, compact. It's not clear that that kind of voluntary agreement is legally binding. And so you could end up in a situation where people think they're addressing that problem and getting rid of the problem of the Electoral College without actually uh, doing so. so. So those are two ways short of a constitutional amendment that people have thought about uh, dealing with this issue. Thank you very much. Uh, next question, please. So Trump claimed back in 2016 that he would have won anyway by campaigning differently if the popular vote had been the decider rather than the electoral college. Do you think he is right? Absolutely not. <laughs> I think the only person in America who actually believes that argument 
is Donald Trump. <laughs> I, I, don't think, uh, I don't know of any serious election expert who uh, believes that. Uh, I don't think smart Republican strategists uh, believe that. I mean, certainly if we didn't have the Electoral College, it would affect candidate strategies and where they spend their time, where they campaign, how they allocate their television advertising dollars. But the same would be true on the other side. So uh, that's not uh, the reason, uh, you know, if we had direct popular uh, voting, uh, that would not provide a rationale for him uh, being able uh, to win. Thank you very much. Uh, we've got another question. Yes. Okay, so where do you think, if ever, the movement for abolishing the Electoral College will come from? Will it come from within the state or will it need a popular movement, i.e. protests, petitions, etc.? Actually, it's already on the agenda. Uh, people are uh, talking about it. I mean, I, I mentioned last year I wrote a, a post about it's time to abolish the Electoral College on the uh, brookings.edu uh, uh, website, I think. The last time I heard, we had uh, 75,000 downloads of uh, that report. So there's been a lot of uh, public interest uh, in that topic. I've done a number of uh, news media interviews and talks on uh, this topic. Uh, there's a lot of discontent with the Electoral College in general. And if Trump happens to win the presidency next week because he won the Electoral College uh, and um, you know, despite having lost the popular vote, this issue is going to be directly on uh, the agenda of every progressive organization, uh, the Democratic Party, and you know the the fifty five percent of Americans that don't like Donald Trump. So that would certainly propel the momentum in that particular uh, direction. Ultimately, in order for there to be a successful constitutional amendment, there has to be votes in the House and Senate. So there has to be national interest in doing it. Uh, but there also have to be three quarters of the state legislature approve it. So uh, it has to there has to be grassroots support for it as well. So you have to in order to pass a constitutional amendment, it has to be both top down and uh, bottom up. And the two would complement each other. Mm. Uh, we've got another question. No, I, think, I think the word is the one more is, is on its way. Um, but I mean, Dr. West, with, the, with regards to the previous question on Trump, I mean, one of the things that I think characterized that campaign in particular was the amount of money that everyone was spending and, you know, Trump boasting about his riches and whatnot. Do you think that any attempt to, uh, well, getting rid of the Electoral College would indeed be enough? Or do you think that it, there would have to be significant changes to campaign finance uh, rules in order to get a lot more representation uh, in, in the American political system? America definitely needs campaign finance reform. I mean, because right now we have a system where large secret donors have an extraordinary amount of influence and they are a tiny portion of uh, the overall uh, population. You know, you're talking about 1% of the 1%, uh, so a very a small slice of America, but, uh, you know, in, ultra wealthy individuals who have tremendous influence, not just over elections, but over American public policy because of the power of money. And, you know, with the power of that money uh, taking place in secret, like there's stuff that happens that we don't even know about. And that's very destructive of any democracy when you have secrecy because it leads to a loss of accountability, creates problems in terms of representation and the system just doesn't uh, function uh, very well. So uh, the US House of Representatives already has passed what it calls HR1, House Resolution uh, 1, which is a campaign finance reform bill, a voting rights bill and an ethics bill. So it's designed to address what people view as the, pro the, the, the current problems of American elections. So the power of large secret money, the poor ethics illustrated by President Trump uh, in his uh, cabinet, uh, 
uh, and uh, kind of the, the need to fight voter suppression that makes it very hard for young people, uh, immigrants, and American minorities to cast their uh, ballots. So that one piece of legislation combines all those things. House Democrats already have passed it. Uh, Speaker Pelosi has already said that, you know, if they have a Democratic president, Democratic House and Democratic Senate, this is going to be the first piece of legislation that they'll pass in the opening weeks of uh, 2021. So we will have campaign and finance reform. Uh, then there will be ethics reform. Uh, if you're a presidential candidate, there will be a requirement. You have to uh, make public your tax returns, uh, which President Trump still has uh, not done, although the New York Times has helped him. Uh, by uh, <laughs> his uh, tax returns. So we do have some uh, information on that. Uh, and just, you know, dealing with this whole issue of voting rights. Uh, I mean, that has been a real problem in uh, recent elections uh, because states have figured out basically how to tilt the election by denying voting rights on a selective uh, basis. So uh, clearly, you know, if Democrats do well uh, next week, uh, that type of reform is going to uh, move forward. But yeah, the, the role of money in American politics is one of the most embarrassing uh, parts of our political system right now and something we need to get right. Mm, yes, thank you very much. Um, what are your thoughts on localism and whether that is another solution for geographic polarization? I guess I have to ask, what does that individual mean by localism? I mean, I, I, I don't actually have access to the viewer's opinion, but I mean, I assume it's talking about uh, grassroots uh, movements from uh, down on the ground in, in states and in local uh, constituencies, uh, as opposed to from a sort of systematic level. Yeah, uh, that could be part of the solution. I mean, like when I think about the problem of polarization, there are things our national government needs to do in terms of tax policy, social policy, and otherwise, just to improve economic opportunity and reduce income inequality. So that is clearly a national government uh, issue, but there certainly is a role for local community uh, groups to deal with uh, polarization as well. Uh, in the United States, we have interfaith partnerships where uh, Muslims, Jews and Christians come together to try and build a consensus on uh, the need, the importance of civility in our national conversations, uh, dealing with polarization, and trying to solve problems. Uh, America actually has a number of community groups that are dedicated to overcoming a polarization and fighting against extremism and fighting against domestic uh, terrorism. So. Uh, as Alexis de Tocqueville in 1830 and 1831 commented, like uh, one thing that has always made America distinctive is we are a nation of joiners. So we like these voluntary associations. We like community uh, groups. Uh, that still remains uh, the case, you know, almost uh, 200 years later. So on issues like polarization, geographic disparities, uh, how you kind of restore civility to American politics, you're gonna need both things that only government can do, but there are things community organizations also can do to try and improve the situation and uh, get people talking in more constructive uh, directions. Right, yes, I mean, I think that makes a lot of sense. Oh, we've just got, just got one more question. Um, what concrete policy outcomes do you predict getting rid of the Electoral College would lead to? Are these specific policies that would become possible slash impossible if the Electoral College was abolished? Well, if we had direct popular voting, uh, that would increase political representation in America. And since America is moving towards becoming uh, more of a majority minority country, policies that are of interest to those communities, it would be easier to address that. So like right now, America has this big problem with law enforcement and you know the shootings of African-Americans. Uh, that's a problem that would get much easier uh, if we got rid of the electoral college because 
now our political system overrepresents certain kinds of views and underrepresents other kinds of views. So making that structural change, making that institutional change would have policy consequences. I think that our policies are more likely to move in a liberal direction just because particularly if you kind of project America 10 years from now, I think the country will be more liberal at that point in time uh, than they are now. And so if you have fair representation and in institutions that are not engaging in voter suppression, you're going to get more liberal policies that come out of that. So I think there definitely will be policy ramifications that result from the institutional changes. Thank you very much. I think that's all the questions we have time for today. Dr. West, do you have any closing remarks for us? Uh, I just want to uh, thank you for organizing uh, this uh, event. It's uh, great to uh, be able to interact with the uh, students at uh, Cambridge. I uh, have a tremendous uh, respect uh, for uh, you and your uh, colleagues. I'm sure uh, great uh, questions and I appreciate the dialogue. Thank you ever so much. Well, I'd like to say a huge thank you to you for joining us and giving us this very fascinating talk, Dr. West. Um, I'd also like to say thank you to our viewers and a just a huge thank you to the behind the teams, uh, behind the scenes tech as well. So join us again soon for another Political Futures event. But until next time, goodbye. <laughs>